Hello everyone, this is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga U Online and I am very pleased to introduce this free talk on the principles of fascia and healthy movement with yoga therapist Yasmin Lambat. Yasmin is a lifelong movement therapist and a somatic mindfulness educator registered with ISMITA, the leading organization for somatic movement practitioners. Her work is based on the work of somatic pioneers like Tom Myers, author of Anatomy Trains, as well as the work of Moshe Feldenkrais, Melvin Traeger, and Eric Franklin of the Franklin Method. Yasmin started out as a personal trainer, and she was, in her own words, a dedicated gym rat. This shifted dramatically, however, when she stumbled on the experience of interoception during a training program to become a Pilates instructor specializing in movement rehabilitation. Interoception involves the ability to sense subtle shifts in bodily sensations, and it is a faculty linked to enhanced intuition and a greater sense of embodiment. This experience and the work that followed led Yasmin to found the Lambat body sensing method, a method designed to help people improve their physical and emotional well-being through somatic movement for enhanced embodiment. This method also incorporates new research insights into how the fascia, the soft tissue of the body, affects the health of body and mind, and how we can use movement to keep the fascia healthy and youthful. In this talk, excerpted from Yasmin's larger course on Yoga U Online on Yoga for Fascial Health and Myofascial Release and the, her body sensing method, Yasmin talks about the basic constituents of fascia and the key principles for keeping the fascia healthy through movement. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the talk. Let's explore what we already know about fascia from fascia research. So this is the stuff that the, the people who are dedicated to fascia research have come up with and uh, we're so, we're so um, blessed to have this information. And often fascia is spoken about as this connective tissue. But recently I heard Jean Gumbeteau, who is the hand surgeon that does amazing pictures of the superficial fascia uh, in vivo underneath the skin. He's got some amazing pictures in his book. He talks about fascia being a moist constituent tissue system. And if you look up the word constituent, it's not a connective tissue, but it forms part of a system. A system that is alive, a system that influences other systems. And it's, it's not just something that moves and shapes us, but is also the medium for communication for our system. So it moves us and shapes us from skin to bone, from head to toe. And if we really look at the somatic part of this, we can explore this in a greater sense of what we know if we see fascia as the moist constituent tissue system. Something that really shifted the way that I started moving my body was this understanding that it wasn't overnight. It took me a while to kind of go, okay, so I have to completely relearn the way that my body moves because I was a complete gym junkie and I would train my body every day, sometimes twice a day, teaching 25 classes and always working against gravity. And then along comes this idea that we have a tensegrity structure, and that was a few years ago. I think the first time I did a workshop with Tom Myers was in 2003, and I couldn't understand it at all at first. I was so confused, and it took me a while, and it was a shift in perception to understand that everything I had learned about toning and shaping and working against gravity and working my abdominals until they were rock hard uh, wasn't necessarily giving me any integrity in my system and it's, it was the reason why I wasn't moving well. So just to share that with you. 
And what began to happen this is this exploration of the body and if our body is or if the system is independent of gravity, what does that mean for movement? How do we now shift that paradigm and what does that feel like in the body to suddenly experience it being independent of gravity? And it's amazing how our perception shapes who we are both in our mind and in our body. So I'm hoping that um, by sharing some of the movements with you, you will have fun with it. Uh, so recently we, again, with Tom Myers, doing a workshop with Tom, and he talks about how movement reorganizes unhealthy fascia. So you have the collagen fibers, and when fascia is unhealthy, these collagen fibers go into kind of a knitted, uh, stuck, sensation in the body and if movement reorganizes fascia we need to look at what type of movement will get those collagen fibers to align and almost kind of go in the same direction so it's we we previously we looked at stretching is there a different way of looking at movement apart from stretching and um, this that's something that I want to share with you today is how I've moved away from stretching and have introduced a different way of reorganizing that those collagen fibers because 60% of fascia is water, bouncy movements can rehydrate fascia. We've spoken about it, and where it comes from is the study that was done by Strobizond looking at how fascia responds to this, this bouncy, uh, restorative type of movement. This next kind of bullet point for me was profound, that fascia autoregulates in response to the nervous system. And if you're like me, over the years, you kind of work in your body, you experience your body, and sometimes you notice things and you go, oh, I wonder if this would work. And we don't have the science behind it, but we have a sensation that, could this be possible? Could we be, for example, working in our nervous system? And so when this came about, and I'm so grateful to Robert Schleit for sharing this, I was like, yes, that's what I've been experiencing. Not working within the muscular system, but there's got to be some way that how we feel and sense ourselves is influenced by our nervous system. So more about that later. And of course we looked at how the connective tissue joins every part of the body one to another, but also connects the various branches of medicine. So um, our endocrine system, the lymphatic system, the immune system, so the chemistry of our system is is connected by this constituent tissue called fascia. Okay, so healthy fascia, how does it feel? And in the fascia research world, it's been described as um, a sponge. So the first image is a sponge, and as you can see, when you squeeze the sponge, you've got this water that squeezes out. So what does that mean for us in terms of movement? So when I did a workshop with Tom Myers a, a couple of um, years ago and recently as well, we always looked at what happens when you add load to fascia. And what happens is it becomes dehydrated. Uh, and what's important to understand is when you add demand on fascia, you are... Um, uh, th 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 there's the chemistry that happens that changes the way fascia absorbs water. So that, I would say, the stress or the demand would change the chemistry, which means that the water is squeezed out. And in a rest and restorative state, the water is reabsorbed into the fascia. So I kind of explored this and thought, OK, how can we apply this to movement without adding demand for someone in chronic pain? So it's important to understand fascia and how it is described. Uh, so the image in the middle with the bowl and a wooden spoon in it is just gelatin that's melted. And that's exactly how the ground substance is. It's this gluey stuff that if you were to stir a wooden spoon in it, it you, you, you should have this kind of feeling of um, hydration, I guess. And if there is less water in that gelatin, you can imagine what it would feel like. It is sticky and it, it, um, 
it creates a different chemical environment for not just your endocrine system but your nervous system as well. So there's, there's a reaction that happens in the entire body when fascia is dehydrated. So healthy fascia has this ability to retain water, it has this, this ability to restore, and it has a springy quality to it. So I've got an image of a spring, not quite a complete spring, but this kind of springiness in the body where the joints feel bouncy and doing movements that uh, give you a little bit of experience of that bounce is where I kind of focus for people who can't add a lot of demand, but they can certainly do some movement that gives them that sensation of spring in the body. And my favorite is this image of Tigger. And uh, if, you, if you were like me when, when you were younger or if you have young children and you were into this whole, um, you know, Winnie the Pooh and, and Tigger, you'll know that Tigger always had this bouncing quality and it's what, what, what we're saying here is it's not how fast you run, it's not how high you climb, but how well you bounce. Um, and hoping that um, you can all leave this with uh, kind of new ways of approaching the body and effortless ways in approaching the body. So we would be exploring a little bit more around release, rewiring and rehydrating in movement. And what I hope that you will take away with you today is um, the fascia research uh, kind of take on training fascia. And it's often based on adding load or adding demand on fascia. And if we're working with uh, people with chronic pain or inflammation or, you know, restoring posture or some the population that's aging, there could be another approach to to kind of what I would say what I would call restoring fascia versus training fascia based on the recommendations for training fascia. I would also like to share with you the body sensing uh, approach to the wisdom of the body and there would be more when you watch the video it would make a little bit more sense when you're looking at the movement. Something I'm really fascinated about, and that is how fascia is our sixth sense, and if it's responding to our language, how do we then communicate with our clients? And, 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 and what I say, what I often say is, you know, uh, talking to fascia. So remembering who you're communicating with and how your communication is influencing already the health of the fascia. We'll be looking at that. And over many years, I have been involved in um, working with the body's core stability. So I started out with uh, looking at the, the, the different diaphragms in the body, looking at uh, the, the, the idea of this core, the central area in the body, and spent a great deal of time researching the anatomy and then found that it was actually there could be a different way of looking at the body without having to over strengthen the core or over cue the core so I've come up with fascial integrity versus stability and I hope that looking at this approach will give you another paradigm to play with and of course the, the number one area in the body where I focus on for release and get my clients to focus on and that we will be exploring a little bit later so I'd like to begin and to, in, in exploring this idea that fascia can be trained. And if we're talking about language, just this idea of using the word train or how to train fascia, um, it becomes a physical sensation in the body. And I would prefer, uh, you know, how we experience fascia or how we sense fascia. So if we look at the recommendations, we can train fascia for elasticity, which is storing and releasing energy. Uh, in the past, we looked at how to strengthen muscle, and there was a question around, you know, what about muscle strength? Where the, I'm, I'm hoping that with this slide, we begin to understand more that we move away from strengthening muscle, and instead, we look at this system that stores energy, and 
we're looking at how do we restore the elasticity of the, the, the fascial net so that when we require energy, it's, it's um, kind of a, a, a stored kinetic energy that we can, we can uh, tap into whenever we require it. So the different training modalities help to, um, help to store this kind of uh, kinetic energy in the system. A bit like um, uh, Robert Schleip mentions a, the way a kangaroo would move. So you've got the energy stored in the Achilles tendon, for example, uh, and you would spring from that kind of the, the feet upwards in a bouncing sensation to restore elasticity. Uh, it can also be, be trained for viscosity, and this is where I focus on the viscosity, the hydration of fascia in a gentle way. We looked at plasticity, the ability to change shape. So fascia can be trained in all these different ways, and fascia can be experienced in all these different ways. One other area that's really important to understand is how fascia responds to the nervous system immediately because the nervous system, as we learn, is embedded within the fascia. But it takes months for fascia to remodel. So what does that mean? I'm not sure if, like me, you work with people in chronic pain and they come to a session and they may have a relaxation session or they have a session where they feel restored, revitalized. And if they are coming in with some kind of pain, the experience is often, you know, I feel less pain. Sometimes there is no pain. And that's a demonstration of how the nervous system can calm down and produce your own anti-inflammatories in the body, your own fluid hormones that would um, uh, kind of reduce the, 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 the pain sensation in the body. But then what happens is that pain sensation hasn't been wired. It hasn't been kind of wired into the system. So what needs to happen is to have a practice, um, a daily practice or regular practice um, for the body to get used to being in that state so that the pain that is long lasting, the pain, the, the, the easing the pain is long lasting. So when we look at pain relief, we're looking at a gentle practice that would um, rewire the body in a way where it gets used to being in less pain and it would change that neural pathway of pain. So I hope that makes uh, a little bit more sense when we talk about fascia response to the nervous system immediately, but it takes months for fascia to remodel. Uh, and in fact, there is um, in the fascia research community, I think Tom Myers mentions it, that it takes six months to remodel fascia. So it, there does need to be more research on the area. But that gives you some idea of how long it takes fascia to remodel. If we look at the fascial orientated training that's been recommended by Robert Schleip from his research, we're looking at whole body movements. Something that I mentioned in, in the question that when we look at anatomy in the old way, I call it the old way, where we looked at individual muscle groups and we created movement or we developed movement around individual muscles. So if you look at weight training, for example, or the equipment that only specifically works one area of the body, like a lat pull down in the gym or bicep curls um, or tricep extensions, for example, and of course yoga doesn't do this, but it's important to understand where the anatomy comes in. If we're looking at fascia, or when we look at fascia, we are looking at whole body movements, engaging the long myofascial chains uh, to create whole body movement. So yoga does that. Yoga poses, yoga asanas do that. The only difference is that those poses are held. And is there a way that we can start looking at yoga differently and introduce some kind of play in yoga or some kind of bouncy sensation in yoga? And I am playing with that at the moment. At how do we add load or how do we create yoga from that kind of bouncy um, hydrating sensation where there's a flow? taking into consideration the long myofascial chains and 
there are different people that are using my fascials, my fascial lines or chains in, in slightly different ways. Tom Myers looks at the lines, there are others who look at the, the relationship between the outer and the inner layer of the body. So whatever modality you're working with, it's important to understand that whole body movements where one part initiates the movement and somewhere else responds is where we are moving to. Because Robert Schleip is a body worker, he recommends the skin and surface tissue stimulation. So if you go to a rolfer or if you go to a myofascial release expert, they would then work with the fascia by rubbing, moving the skin, um, adding some kind of friction to enhance the fascial proprioception, so uh, to enhance the sensation of the receptors within the fascia so that they're able to experience sensation differently. And sometimes we don't always have that luxury of being able to do both body work and movement. And I've come up with a way of kind of integrating skin and surface tissue stimulation by really simple movements where you're just gliding the skin backwards and forwards, uh, sensing the opening of the skin and using the ground as a surface, for example, using the heels of the hands or using the heels of the feet uh, to experience that sensation of, of tissue stimulation. The directing clients to feel their fascial tissues comes from the somatic principles. Uh, an example of that is when you're asking somebody to notice sensation in the body. Um, again, if one part moves, how does, how does something else respond? And when you're going into this interoceptive way of experiencing the body, it becomes a completely new sensation. So slowing down to notice, for example, experiencing uh, using your kinesthetic sense for more accurate and fully informed information. He uses the word sensuous body activity and in somatic principles, that's really what happens. We kind of slow down, we experience uh, what happens in movement. Feldenkrais is a very good example of that. Really working with the way the body is designed, working with the wisdom of the body in movement. And that's where we're heading to uh, in terms of restoring fascia. And what I would say is focusing more on interoception. We do a lot on proprioception, but moving towards interoception, integrating our sense of self and how we are embodied within our fascia. So it's, a, it's an exciting space to be in, and it means that not only are you influencing the shape of our body, but the shape of our minds as well. The, the, the last kind of um, principle for fascia-oriented training is looking at this dynamic elasticity. And Robert Schleip has created something called fascial fitness, and he looks at preparatory counter movements. So if you're doing, for example, a forward flexion, you would then counter move to a backward movement or, or, or extension. So going from flexion to extension, not so much in a slow way, but in a, in a in, in, in a kind of quicker way. Um, so there's those counter movements, there's the bouncy movements, and if we look at the next slide, it gives you an example of some of the fascia orientated training principles that have come up. So fascial fitness is one of them, and what Robert Schleip does in fascial fitness is the myofascial release, and oh yes, something I forgot to mention with the tissue stimulation, we spoke about how body workers um, uh, use manual therapy for tissue stimulation. In, in the um, self-myofascial release environment, we have things like the foam rollers or the overballs for tissue stimulation. So not forgetting that there is an option for self-myofascial release with the foam rollers, with the, t with the um, overballs. Uh, and to use the, the, the overballs, um, I don't know if you know of them, they're sometimes called Pilates balls, but they, if you have them in a slightly deflated uh, kind of ball versus a fully, uh, a, a, a fully inflated ball, it helps to soften the fascia. 
and I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. But if we go through what's available out there, uh, there's, possibly, there's, there's a lot more. So fascial fitness is the one that most people know. We are now seeing um, modalities like primal movement, um, primal play, movement that's designed in the way the body has been designed to move. Pilates has been around for a long time now. I remember when I first did my Pilates training, I think it was in 98, um, it was something that was completely unheard of. And if I said I'm teaching Pilates, no one knew about it. It's becoming, well, it's become really, really, really popular. And I'm hoping that in the fascia world, we will be seeing fascial movement becoming more popular. With Pilates, I personally don't feel that the mat work is efficient in working fascia. The Pilates equipment with the springs is far more effective because as you can see the spring system works with the spring system. Um, I still think working with our own bodies and finding the, the springiness in our own bodies uh, is far better, although with, with the Pilates spring assisted equipment it does improve proprioception. If we're looking at natural movement, there's running, running in a springy body, and then we have skipping as well. And those are the recommendations for fascia training. Something that I want to mention here, and um, it's to do with the, the way in which we restore fascia through manual therapy. Uh, if your fascia is tight, and you're using manual therapy or even self-myofascial release to restore fascia. Fascia does not respond to uh, a strong sensation of pressure, especially if it's tight. So fascia, does, fascia responds less effectively, if you like, if, you ha you're, if you're using a firm foam roller. What will happen is that the, 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 the nociceptors, the pain receptors respond and you, you may experience some pain or discomfort. That's your body saying that I don't like this. Your body saying I don't want to be in pain. And what I found works far better are the soft overballs or the soft foam rollers. I really prefer the overballs because it feels like fascia can melt better with um, a softer ball. So what you want is soft on tight. That's the tip. If, if you're wanting to do self myofascial release, you want to use a softer um, foam roller or an overball on tight fascia.